Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Without further ado, welcome to Local History Happy Hour with Betsy Chess. Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the program, the Barbara Bernard Smith, Executive Director of the Museum of Ventura County, Elena Brokaw. Elena and Betsy, why don't you flip those microphone switches on and we'll get underway. Hello, everybody. Um, it is so exciting to be here. For those of you at home, Betsy and I are here at the Museum of Ventura County in our Martin V and Martha K. Smith Pavilion with a live audience. There are people here. <laughs> we made it. Uh, so welcome to Local History Happy Hour. This is the first uh, hybrid event that we've done and we're really excited to be here. This uh, series is one where we talk to local authors about themselves, about their books, and about the region and their lives. Tonight, we are talking to Betsy Chess, whom I'm sure needs no introduction for most of you. She is an extraordinary leader in our community. Uh, she has been the executive director of nonprofits. She sits on the Limonera board. She sat on too many other boards to name. She has edited and published a uh, magazine. Uh, she's a fundraiser extraordinaire. Watch out if she comes towards you asking for money. Seriously, watch <laughs> out. And uh, tonight she is here to talk about her latest iteration as author of her book, perhaps the first, Daughter of the Land, Growing Up in the Citrus Capital of the World. Betsy, lovely to have you here. Elena, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's so, wonderful. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank the museum. Thank everyone behind the scenes that's making this happen. And thank all of you here in the audience and at home. Um, we're gonna have a good time. So part of our show always is uh, I ask Betsy some questions, we have a little conversation, and then it's time for you all and for you at home to ask questions. If you're watching on Zoom, just put your questions in the Q&A. If you're watching on Facebook, put them in the comments. We've got people looking for them, and we'll take your questions in about 35, 40 minutes uh, before we wrap up. Um, so. It is local history happy hour and we always feature whatever sort of happy hour drink our author likes. So Betsy, why don't you tell us about what we're drinking tonight? All right, um, this is, it had to be something to do with citrus, of course. So, uh, but not just any citrus. This is a little vodka, a little tangerine juice. Thank you, Trader Joe's. And uh, Elena's addition, a little uh, uh, soda water, little spritz. So this is the, the Chess Queen's Gambit to the chess queen. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you all. And of course, if you want it without the vodka, it is quite delicious as just uh, tangerine and Perrier. So Betsy, I uh, was lucky enough to get one of the advanced copies of your book. I read it in one day. It was a Sunday. Um, and if I had to categorize your book, which I do, because I am the interviewer on this show, I would say it's part memoir. You are a fifth generation Californian? Yes. I believe fifth generation Santa Paulan. Um, part history lesson, not only about our county, but also of California and immigration. And really mostly it's all about your family and about, and not just your family, but all families. So Tim Gallagher uh, reviewed your book. And in the review, he said, Betsy tells an engrossing tale through the lens of her family. I am most appreciative of Betsy's honesty in storytelling. No family or person is perfect, and she is unflinching in telling the successes and the warts of her family history and her own story. So to give people who haven't had a chance to read the book yet um, a sense of what it, was, what it is, could you read an excerpt? I'll be happy to. Um... I think the reason we chose this excerpt is because of what's going on around us today. And that was in uh, uh, 1957, I got very ill right after getting the first polio shots. And uh, so um, that's what I'm gonna read a bit, a bit about. Talk a bit about um, uh, somebody that was very important in my life, my aunt, but I go on to say in 1957, when I was nine years old, the sock vaccine against polio was developed and given to school children across the country, myself and my classmates at Barbara Webster School among them. Towards the end of that year, about Christmas time, time I developed terrible cramps in my legs. The osteopath put it down to growing pains, but by the time my parents had a big Christmas party a day or two later, I was in bed very sick. Dr. Artemis Strong, pioneer Santa Clara Valley physician and the man who had delivered me, 
stuck his head into my room to check on me. I was stark raving delirious with fever. He grabbed me by the arm and dragged me into the bathroom where he pushed me under a cold shower. Polio was still very much on people's minds, even with the advent of the new vaccine, and my symptoms, leg cramps and high fever, were alarming. I spent the next two weeks in isolation at the old Foster Hospital, predecessor of Community Memorial Hospital in, in Ventura. I remember that experience vaguely, all alone except for my white briar plastic horse, Silver, and much-loved blue stuffed horse name Charger. Strange adults in white came and went. What was I suffering from? Was it polio, a reaction to the new vaccine, a case of polio arrested by the vaccine, or was it meningitis, another possibility, as my spine was stiff and inflexible? A spinal tap would have answered the question definitely, but it was a risky procedure for a child and one of last resort. Fortunately, I began to recover, so to this day, the mystery illness was never diagnosed. So that's just a little bit of an excerpt from Betsy's book. And that is really about her uh, specifically. But the questions that I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to go way back in time to start. So with that in mind, let's talk about, uh, you spend a lot of time in your book talking about your great grandfather, Nathan Weston Blanchard who was born in Maine in 1831 and traveled to California for the first time in 1854. I love the story of his trip and of the reason for his trip. So can you share that with us? Yes, uh, great grandfather. We have a lot of Nathan Weston Blanchards in our family. I think we're up to number five. So um, this was the original, we just refer to him as NWB. And uh, he uh, was always very studious and had worked on his grandfather's farm and also as a tutor and, and, in, and in his later teens actually had a school. Um, and he did this so he could pay for his tuition at Waterville College, which is now today Colby College. So um, in 1854, he however was a senior and he couldn't pay for his senior year. His father, great-grandfather Merrill had already come to California in 1851 to look for gold. So NWB thought he would just go out to California, scoop up some of those gold nuggets and be back in another couple of years to Maine to finish his, his uh, uh, education. Well, he was in California for 10 years. He had a harrowing trip um, to the Isthmus of Panama. At that time, there was a railroad, but it only went halfway across. So we went halfway across by rail, then by mule, and then took ship on the other side on the Pacific Ocean and up to California. Um, he was all over the uh, basically Tuolumne County, Petaluma, that area in the gold country. He was a terrible gold miner, never found anything. Um, he uh, met up with his father, who gave up and went home to Maine. Um, but uh, he was a hard worker, and he got he had made more money as in the meat business and in the lumber business than he ever did as a gold miner. And uh, so he was actually elected to state assembly. And the one uh, bill that he had passed, which my brother who is here this evening and I love, it was to ban the women with their rouge and tambourines from hanging out in the, in the saloons and going into the gold mine, into the gold fields. <laughs> Which gives you, I think, a bit of a flavor about, about great grandfather. <laughs> he was he was rather straight laced. I've, I have to ask, why the tambourines? What was I wrong know, with the tambourines? It, it just it just brings such amazing color to it, you know. <laughs> I mean, can't you just see them, you know? Yes. <laughs> But uh, anyway, he actually was um, elected to state assembly, the California State Assembly, in 1863. And he served there, but then he got a very interesting call. He had a, a, a cousin named Jotham Bixby. And Jotham is known as the father of Long Beach. If you've been down to Long Beach, the Bixby name may be familiar. So he, Jotham wanted him to come to Long Beach, and I'll tell you why in a bit, but it was great grandfather's first trip down this wonderful Santa Clara Valley. And like so many of the early pioneers, he was just amazed at the fertility and it stuck in his mind. So he gets down to, to um, uh, uh, Long Beach and Jotham convinces him that he needs to take a very large herd of sheep to the railhead in St. Louis. 
And my brother and I went, really? This was 1864. The Civil War is raging. What is going on? Well, it was really a very shrewd business move by cousin Jotham because um, with the Civil War, cotton was no longer available to do uniforms. So wool was very um, important. So that's what he did. So he goes, gets these herd of sheep to uh, the railhead in St. Louis, and then he returns to Maine. And there he meets under a very charming ruse, his wife-to-be, great-grandmother, um, and he wants to marry in Maine. And she goes, she knows that if she goes to California, and who knew what was in California? And she was leaving a very pleasant life. Her uncle was the, the um, governor of New Hampshire. Um, and so she said to him, you go. And if I find I can't live without you, I will follow. Which I <laughs> Go granny, you know. So he once again came, went across the Isthmus of Panama. She came later lamenting that it was so hard to get any, you know, letters, communication from California. But she went round the horn and they were married um, in San Francisco. Uh, went up to uh, Dutch Flat after a bit and that's where they lived for the next, uh, next several years. So... Uh... Thank you. I, I such an evocative and fantastic really? story. And while I'm thinking it, I'm supposed to all, also be queuing pictures. So, gentlemen, can we see a picture of uh, great grandfather and great grandmother, please? There he is. Looking that's at NWB. That's NWB, and that's a, that's about when he was in 1864. So he was about 30 then. <laughs> yeah, and then and then the next the next picture are the two of them, great grandmother and great grandfather looking, that was about 1870 and he's looking very prosperous and very, very fine. So speaking of looking very prosperous and very fine, um, there are, you have an expansive family tree and there are a lot of successes in your family tree. But there were also a lot of pitfalls along the way, which is, you know, sort of what Tim Gallagher was talking about is your willingness to talk about that. So I want to talk about one in specific. Um, when your grand great grandparents moved to Ventura County, which was in 1873, well, 72, 73, right. Um, and they had two children at that time, right? Or one child. Yes, they'd lost one child and, and they had two daughters. Um, so your great grandfather and WB bought 2,700 acres of the former Mexican land grant, Rancho Santa Paula y Satacoy, from George Briggs. And he did that in partnership with his associate from the mining camp, Dutch right. Flat, in Northern California, somebody named Alicia? Elisha? Elisha Bradley. Bradley. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that did not end well. What happened? <laughs> well, Elisha was a silent partner. Uh, he went on to become a state senator, never came down to, to uh, Ventura County. Uh, originally, it was a 50-50 partnership, but in the ensuing almost decade, grandfather, great-grandfather had borrowed to develop the town, to develop ranching and so forth. And so um, it, the 50-50, the it became a, a larger investment on the part of Mr. Bradley. Um, in a year after he arrived, great-grandfather planted 100 acres of oranges. And a few years later, he budded half of them to lemons. The oranges planted in 1874 did not start to, to produce until 1888. So um, of course it was referred to as Blanchard's folly and so forth. Um, but meanwhile, in 1880, Mr. Bradley was bitten by a cat. Three weeks later, he's dead. Cat scratch fever. And uh, enter into the story, uh, the widow Bradley. And uh, as I say, the partnership was about one six grandfather and five six now the widow. And she sued to regain her, her value. And so great grandfather and the family were left with, uh, she took about almost 3000 acres and he was left with 450 acres, which included a mill. I forgot to talk about that. He started a grist mill, um, uh, which was very successful. She took that. And she also took the property on which their family home stood. So um, they moved into the foreman's house. And I think we've got some pictures. Well, let's wait on that, Eric. Let's wait before we get into that. But um, it was a very dark time. 
and uh, uh, cousin Jotham Bixby came to the rescue, lent great grandfather $5,000, which in today's dollars would have been about $125,000. So it was a huge um, life-saving uh, loan. And uh, my great aunt who wrote a charming book, she said, without that loan, our, something about the plight would have been as dark as any slum dweller. Um, but so they lived rather simply, but he still was very involved. Um, he was one of the founders of Pomona College, uh, helped to find, found what was originally the Santa Paula Academy and then became Santa Paula High School. So, and then hallelujah, those oranges finally started to produce. And uh, within a very few years, he was sending thousands of pounds of especially oranges, but also lemons. And you can imagine in December to get a, an orange in those days, that was a big deal. So he did very well. Yeah. So great. It kind of reminds me of East of Eden. That's that part. Of yes, story. exactly. Okay, so let's go down a, a run on your family tree and talk about your grandfather, Nathan Weston Blanchard Jr., NWB Jr. Okay. Right. Um, so I've heard a lot about him actually from you through the years. And one of the things you say in your book that you is that you had always thought of him as the black sheep of the family. But in your research, we'll talk about your research in a little bit, you changed your thinking and now you see him as a lost sheep. Yes. So right, he's got a really fun and entertaining story. He does. He does indeed. It. I forgot kind of an important thing uh, before we get to, gra to grandfather. So Santa Paula was founded in 1873. In 1893, great grandfather and Wallace Libby Hardison, who along with uh, Lyman Stewart, uh, co-founded the Union Oil Company, founded the Lehman Era Company, which is rather an important part of the story. So Got to, got to get that in. Okay, great grandfather. So Q, Q, great grandfather. Um, he he was born in Santa Paula in 1873, and I had always heard. Well, first of all, if you can read that letter, he was he got thrown out of Thatcher. Um, oh, and then there was the elopement. Oh, and then there were the high stakes poker games he ran upstairs in the Glen Tavern in Santa Paula. Perfect black sheep, perfect black sheep. But as I started reading the letters, which were housed right here in the uh, library of the Ventura, Muse or Ventura Museum of Ventura County, I saw a different person. He wrote letters from um, Thatcher and also from the almost military academy he was sent to up in San Francisco. And this was a very lonely, homesick young man. And then the elopement. I had heard that the lady was, um, shall we say, of little regard, <laughs> and that great grandfather went after them. She probably wore rouge. She probably wore. I don't, I don't know about the tam. Maybe the tam. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But great grandfather, I heard, went after them, brought them home, had the wedding annulled. No, they were married for eight years, um, and they did in fact divorce. And what's interesting was that my father, great grand or grandfather married again three years later to my grandmother, Grandma Tiny, as we called her. Um, and he died in 1932. My father and his brothers never knew about a first wife until after their father died. So it, it was an interesting story. But back if we can again, Eric, can we go back to the, uh, the, the picture? Um, I don't, can, I, you can, basically this is a letter from Sherman Day Thatcher, the founder of, of, uh, of Thatcher School saying, if I never see your kid again, it's too soon, but I hope we can always be friends. <laughs> he calls, he said that, that, that this kid was a, a menace to his school, that he get, cannot abide a liar and a cheat, but he hoped that the family could be friends. And it must have worked because grandfather's three sons all went to Thatcher. Um, and various others through the uh, generations, including my own da daughter, have gone there. But um, yeah, he must have been quite a quite a guy. So there are a lot of stories in your book about the turn of the century period in Santa Paula and your family. But uh, let's talk about you for a bit, because mostly the book is about you and you're here. So when you look back on your childhood in Santa Paula and compare it to what it might have been like today, how would you characterize the differences? You know, it's interesting because I refer to it as my free wheeling animal filled life, say that fast, animal filled life on the ranch. 
And it was a wonderful life. There were horses and dogs and uh, chickens and the boys from FFA had their lambs and their, and their steers. It was great. My brothers had a club called the Daredevil Club in the big barn. And initiation was to walk across a very slim um, uh, girder 20 feet over a cement floor. I mean, you know, we did kind of cra crazy things like that. However, the flip side of that was that family life, and especially um, with my great aunt Sarah, was very formal. And um, uh, she had a marvelous house that she'll see later. And I'm sure I was probably one of the eight or nine year olds in town who knew how to properly take a finger bowl off of a plate in, in a formal setting. I mean, it was a very, it was formal. So I don't, I think that kind of life, you know, is, is gone. But I know early readers of the book, one of them being here, who was a proofreader, said it really resonated the fact of in those days as young girls, especially preteen girls, we were just, you know, we played with the boys against the boys and we played to win. Um, and we were uh, bold and I think perhaps even maybe a bit bolder than young girls are today. Huh, interesting. So. How very interesting. What a, what a, that would be so um, interesting to dig into and figure out why yeah. that is indeed. All right. So you, you were just talking about your aunt Sarah, your great aunt Sarah, right. right? And before we go, I have to show a picture. Eric, you, you had it there of my friend, best friend, Donna Crouch and me. Donna, you remember, she became Donna Crouch Linderos and was city manager in Ventura for several years. But we were best friends and uh, I just love that picture. And it's also interesting because when I would go to dinner at the Crouch household, there were five children and we laughed, you know, and they, we poked fun at one another and that didn't happen in my family. Not the poking fun, it was rather just a lot more serious. Yeah. You know? It's interesting because you talk about your, your great aunt, Sarah, right? Right, right? A lot in the book and very lovingly. And, if, and I didn't get the impression of her as this extraordinarily proper person with yeah. finger bowls. Yeah. Well, she just, it was, I, I think it was the, um, the era and the way to uh, the house, as you will see, there was just fabulous collections of, um, well, Chumash baskets, wonderful uh, uh, Chinese pottery that had been brought through the years by, by Chinese um, um, uh, employees. It just, it was a magical house. And uh, so she, she entertained in a grand scale. Well, let's talk actually about her and her home, El Naranjo, right? right? Where right. was it? Uh, it was located, if you're familiar with Santa Paula, go up Palm Avenue, all the way to the end, uh, you're going up Palm Avenue to the east would be Santa Paula High School. And her estate was about 10 acres right there at the top. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And uh, well, well, we'll talk about the fate of it. Well, yeah, later. let's talk about it. Okay. Should we so, show some of the pictures? Um, this first, I believe, there's, Aunt, oh, here's Aunt Sarah. On the left is the lady that I knew. Um, loving, kind, wonderful. And there she is in 1904 in full regalia. She never married. And she said that was because her sister Eunice married the only available bachelor in town. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe that was, that was true. But I remember her as smart and funny, well-traveled. Um, she was certainly the family matriarch and um, the last link to the town's founding. And she was very revered by, by townspeople as well. I remember she loved to walk. And she said, people were always stopping going, Miss Sarah, can I give you a ride? Oh, she wanted to walk. So she joined Sadaquay Country Club so she could play golf and walk <laughs> and not be bothered. <laughs> so do we have photos of the house? We do. Let's we go do. to those and you can talk about what happened to it. That was really something. Photos of the house? Yep, there they are. Oh, hello. All right. Um, starting at the bottom right, I mentioned that when the widow Bradley wreaked havoc on the family, um, the family's, the home was actually taken. So that bottom right was in fact the foreman's home into which the family moved. So that would have been um, 1880 something or other. That home was probably built around 1875. And above it is the very early years, probably about 1904, as it was beginning to take shape. 
And then to the left is the El Neron Hall, which means place of the orange uh, that I knew and grew up with. So that picture was taken probably about 1965. And, uh, um, these are some of the interiors and you get a, a picture. It's come a long way from the, uh, from the foreman's house. Yeah. <laughs> Those glorious ceilings. Um, you can just see some of the collections and so forth. Uh, the dining room, formal dining room. The uh, children's table with the window seat were, uh, you can't see, but they were, uh, um, uh, you know, we still, we st even the children ate formally, but they didn't get to eat at the big people's table. <laughs> um, the one picture that I particularly love is the bottom right, because it shows into the living room, which was really the heart of the home. And I remember Christmas because, um, again, it was very formal, ladies in long dresses, gentlemen in, in uh, um, white tie, not even tuxedo. And the adults drank old fashions and the children got apple juice. So, <laughs> so what happened? Well, the home was, um, Aunt Sarah died in 1963 and she was 95. Um, it was, uh, we tried to give the house to the city of Santa Paula and Santa Paula said, we can, we're having trouble keeping the Union Oil Museum. What would we do? And the coach barn, I should have showed you a picture of that, but it was where I spent my life with my horses and so forth. There were plans to move it up to Steckel Park and it burned down. And then Aunt Sarah's house, um, the property was, was sold. It was to be subdivided. And then uh, there were gonna be beautiful estate homes. And then I guess there was a recession. That never happened. The house was raised to the ground. It was just such a tragedy. And I think it was not, that was only four years before the same fate happened to the Blanchard Library, right? 1969. And I just think it was, you know, historical preservation just hadn't arrived in Santa Paula. Um, so we lost, we lost a lot. Yeah, and at the same time, the city of Ventura, you know, lost a lot of yes. its old, beautiful brick buildings that had been built yeah. like around the same exactly. time. So yeah, all, all over the place. Um, okay, so as we said at the beginning, your book is not only a memoir, it's also a history lesson. And, and one of the things I really uh, appreciated about it is that you do not shy away from the book in acknowledging your privilege and how, you know, you talked a little bit about your animal frolicking fun, yeah, time, right. I could say it, uh, on the ranch. <laughs> but that was, you know, you remember your childhood as a golden time, mm -hmm. and it was very different for those around you. So how yeah. did you... What made you um, take pains to include that? And how did you go about um, sort of researching about what it was like for others? Yes, it, it really was a golden time for me. And I don't, I don't remember my classes in, a, in elementary school being segregated. But as we then progressed from elementary school to when you would be in a, a single subject class, then segregation did kind of rear its head, not so much segregation per se, but that just kids who were perhaps learned English as a second language were likely less to, to score less well on, on standardized tests. So our classes were segregated. But then I started to wonder about what it must have been like. And I re, uh, relied heavily on a book by a woman named Martha Mancheca, who had grown up in Santa Paula. And uh, uh, she talked about, well, I mentioned that I went to Barbara Webster School, which was on the west, um, uh, the east side of town, which was referred to as Mexican town. And when I, I was there, 57, 59, it was built in 1925. It was called Canyon School, totally segregated, about 950 children. There were eight classrooms, an office, a couple of restrooms. At the same time, Isabel School, was built on the northeast part of town, about the same number of children, 22 classrooms, a cafeteria, auditorium, several offices. So it was it was very different, and um, and so that's that's when I, I I realized how how different things were in that regard. Um, segregation, I think, also uh, reared its ugly head later. Um, there was a gentleman named Julio Peralta, mm -hmm. and he had lived on Santa Paulus Creek um, uh, uh, for 27 years. He was, and so, but he was sued by the Santa Paula Waterworks, aka great grandfather, 
um, to get to get the water the water rights. And um, he, however, his his water rights were upheld because he was referred to, and this was so interesting, as a Mexican of pure Spanish descent, which was very different if you were a mixed race um, or a Mexican person. So he had a special standing with the court. That case was litigated and came up again in um, uh, uh, 1876. And um, it was upheld again, but the view of him was very different. The, uh, the um, uh, plaintiffs, yeah, he, who uh, ironically, many of you know that th this is a small town and my dear friend, John Orr, his great grandfather was the attorney in this case, Orestes Orr by the, and, and so he said that, that, this, that uh, Peralta was not a citizen that he didn't even have the right to the water. Again, the case was upheld, but um, uh, by this time, Mr. Peralta's, um, you know, he, he, he was, he had been, you know, he'd been defending himself through the courts. He was bankrupt and he left the area. So that was the end of it. Well, and that happened in so many of the ranchos. Yes. We saw that right. after the, uh, after statehood in uh, 1850. So it's a story all over the place. Right. I really was struck one of the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote you now. Uh, when you talk about this in your book, uh, you say, were the, okay, did might make right in this situation? In my opinion, assuredly, yes. Were the actions of the plaintiffs the product of their times? Again, I believe they were. Am I glad there is not a statue of Nathan Blanchard, great grandfather, NWB, somewhere in town? Again, yes, because it would very likely be the focus of the type of discussion and dissent we are witnessing today. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about you. So there's some wrenching moments in your book, including the deaths of your great aunt, uh, your father and your grandfather in extraordinarily quick succession mm -hmm. in your teens. Um, I know it was really difficult, but can you talk a little bit about that and how it really changed? It your did. World? It really did. My father um, and my grandfather died within a month of, of each other, and um, I was in I was in Norway as a an, as, as an exchange student. Um, I found out about my grandfather's death literally as I was boarding the plane. Not sure why my mother did that, um, but it was a heck of a send off to say the least. Uh, and then um, uh, less than a month later, my father died. And I found out about it through letters. Um, and my Norwegian family didn't speak nor read English. So I, I read a letter from my mother telling them about my father's death and they fall apart. So, you know, I was saying, it's all right, whatever. Um, I was there for another month. I was able to talk to my mother and I said, what do you want me to do? I'm 17, just tell me what to do. And she said, I think your father would have wanted you to stay, which of course was as good as a, an order. So I did, but it was, it was a miserable another couple of weeks. I came back home. I wanted to stay in Santa Paula. Meantime, before that, I had gone off to a, had been sent to a boarding school in La Jolla called the Bishop School. Um, I didn't want to go back. I wanted to stay home, but mom was concerned that if I went to Santa Paula High School, I wouldn't get into a, an elite college. So I didn't go. Well, didn't help. Uh, I went back to Bishops. I was so unhappy. I did poorly on my SATs. Um, frankly, when the family came to, down for my graduation, I thought they had come to witness my failure. I just, just thought I'd blown it. Um, I went to SC, not to some elite college. Probably was the best thing that could happen to me because I was never really challenged academically, but I had a sure good time at SC. <laughs> <laughs> did you, I, you didn't give them the photo of you at the did, party? I didn't. That was a great She picture. had a tambourine. She did. <laughs> <laughs> I practically did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my. So, um, yeah, I guess that was, uh, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a difficult time and obviously, but, um, uh, I obviously lived through it and, and lar largely was because of support of family, friends. Uh, I joined a, fraternity, a sorority at, at SC. My Pi Beta Phi sisters were very helpful. So, yeah. I'm going to um, 
change a little bit. And I'm going to talk about your uh, process of research and writing this book. So one of the things that you said way before in this interview is you said that your great grandmother, Anne, so mm -hmm. Anne, Anne Elizabeth, right. Anne Elizabeth said, you know, uh, Nathan, you go back to California. If I can't live without you, then I'll, I'll come out. Right. right. How did you find that? Is that, is that family lore? Was that written down? Interesting question. Yes, it was my great aunt, Sarah, um, when she was 93, wrote her memoir. So she's got it all over me. Um, and so it was in her book that she told it. And uh, she had, Aunt Sarah only had one year of formal schooling. And you read this book and it is an absolutely beautifully written and charming tale. And it's told from her, her uh, memories as a child. And uh, evidently her mother was an inveterate letter writer. And uh, so lots of letters back and forth from Maine to California. And I know Aunt Sarah said, so when she first went to Maine at the age of 20 and met her aunts and so forth, she said, I knew them almost better than they knew my, themselves <laughs> because I had lived with them at, through the letters of, of, her, of her parents. Yeah, so wow. that, was, that was one. That was one uh, source. Makes you feel bad for uh, descendants of us, right? What yeah. are they going to be able to do? Exactly. Look at? You know, we'll just have our emails, yeah. which will be long gone. Yeah, you know. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk actually about the whole process for you um, and how you got started for those other sort of aspiring um, authors out there. Uh, how did you do your research for this book? Well, it was interesting because I, I had incubated. You know what I didn't say procrastinated. I had incubated this book for a long time. And I think about now, it's like, why, why did I do that? Because I'm a trained historian. Um, I'm a, a trained writer. Um, I was well-versed in lore and, and family history. Plus, not only Aunt Sarah, but I had an uncle who had written a book on family. And others in the field had written about history. And I thought, what could I add? What could I add? And uh, my brother John and I, at the end of February of last year, went to the 110th anniversary of the founding of the Santa Paula Blanchard Library, the Dean Hobbs Blanchard Memorial Library, late, named after the firstborn of NWB and his wife who had died. And there's a story there. Mm -hmm. um, so John and I were there. We were talking about our memories of growing up with the library. And then I talked about the fam, the founding, and it just got dawned on me that I had an opportunity as a new the new generation. I could interpret source material differently. I could bring a fresh point of view and um, um, just new interpretations to an old story. As I mentioned, that was the last week in February. Two weeks later, the pandemic. The, the lockdown. And fortunately, I was surrounded with source materials and just this bounty of pictures. And I also had time, blessed with time and uh, uh, no more excuses. So that's when I started. And the first draft was completed in May. So about two months later, I, gosh, I was so proud of myself. 12,000 words. I mean, what more could be said? And I put it out to early readers and everybody was very um, supportive, but basically said, this is a good outline. <laughs> you, you've just begun. I'd like to know more about this person or that person. So the book that you will see is 36,000 words. And um, so it, there was a lot of work more to, more to be done. And uh, uh, one of the besides having, as I mentioned, source materials and pictures at home, I was able to use, again, as I mentioned, the letters that were housed here in the research library. And um, that was just such a blessing. Um, I, I, uh, uh, if I could send a message to my ancestors, would you please number the pages of your letters? <laughs> Oh, Lordy. I mean, they wrote in the, you know, in the margins. And it, it was very difficult. In fact, Renee Talent, who is the um, uh, collections manager here at the museum, is a whiz at deciphering handwriting of 150 years ago. So I was very grateful to that. But um, I would say 
you 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 get you start you get um, you're 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 living in your head you're living in your in your writing um, and then go and choose good people have good people around you and I feel I had the best I chose Charles Johnson who's here this evening uh, Charles was formerly the research librarian of this museum sure yes applause uh, Charles was both my editor and my book designer and we were a very good pair because he is such an historian that he was able to make sure that my manuscript was not only a good read, but also historically accurate. Um, and, and also too, we made a decision that this would be, I'll call it an old fashioned book. Right now we are at a crux, a turning point in the history of books really. In some ways, I don't, I may be overstating, but almost as important as the beginning of the printing press. And that is the war for readers between the printed word that you read on your lap, <laughs> not your laptop, and um, uh, your Kindle and eBooks. And so we decided this was gonna be a book that you, you lovingly read. And it has over 265 page, uh, pictures in it. So there's no way that this could be a Kindle book. But just to give you an idea of what's happening, as I mentioned, this watershed. Nowadays, when a book becomes an ebook, it's all about flowable text. You've probably, if you've ever, if you read on a Kindle, well, I can't read the 12 point or eight point type. So I bump it up to 14 point. What happens? The whole text flows. So therefore, page numbers are no longer relevant. If page numbers are no longer relevant, neither are tables of contents or, indice or indexes. So we are at a real turning point. And uh, if you're going to write a book, you have to make a decision. What's it going to be? Is it going to be an ebook, or is it going to be <laughs> a, lo a, a loving book? But um, as I say, I, I was surrounded by wonderful people who, Charles, Sherry Brandt, who's here this evening, who, as I refer to in my book, is the world's best proofreader. Um, I had wonderful people who did early reading, including uh, Tim Gallagher, um, Harry, Henry Dubroff, who's a, the uh, editor publisher of the Pacific Coast Business Times, our own Ivor Davis, uh, and uh, Judy Tream and her, her husband, Mitch Stone, all, all read this book. And I'm so grateful for their, for their um, uh, comments. Um, the Peralta story changed thanks to Mitch's um, uh, uh, comments and so forth. So you get all of this information, but at the end of the day, and you get all this help, but at the end of the day, it's your book. It's your book. And uh, so you sit down and you write it. And I, I loved every minute of it. I learned so much. And I hope when the time comes, when you all have a chance, you'll enjoy it as much as I did in creating it. Well, I, I do have to say, Charles Johnson is here tonight. And without Charles and without what he created in the library, he and Alberta Word actually also here tonight and Sherry Brandt, I don't know that you would have this book. I don't know that we would have the source material. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Many thanks yeah, to the museum yeah. and all the work it's done well right. before I got yeah. involved. Um, I would like to open it up for some questions. I wanted, before we yes. go, let's talk a bit about my mom. Okay. We do may we not have time? time for questions. Yeah, it's your, it's your hour. All right, let's just do some pictures. Many of you know Elizabeth Blanchard, my mother. Um, she uh, was a remarkable lady. Let's, let's do, uh, gentlemen, the... Um, uh, the pictures of mom when she was, uh, this was 1935, so she would have been 18. And this was a picture taken at the, uh, on the Rincon. Uh, oh, I love this picture. Yeah, it's oh, a she would be picture. so happy, I think, with this. There she is. Look at that. Wow. That's, that was my caption. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then another picture, um, which I just love this next one. There's mom at the beach and Vern Freeman, again, a long time uh, name that, that we know. This is my parents. You know, it's hard sometimes to think of your parents as being young and in love, 
Look at that picture. I just love it. Um, and uh, Mother was very well known. She was very active in the community, um, was uh, uh, president of the board of directors here at the museum. In fact, she negotiated with Mr. Stewart for the George Stewart historical fi figures, which she infamously was known to have called dolls, which if you know, was like anathema, they were not bad. So anyway, but there's one last picture that I want to show of my mother. Well, there's two. One is uh, she and my, my got both grandmothers and another couple of dear friends. I mean, is that the definition of a white gloves tea party? Which I just love. <laughs> and then here's mother at uh, age 80. And I just refer to it as finishing strong. She was, uh, was a crop walk. And there she was crossing the finish line. So there we go. Anyway, I just wanted to include mom. I actually, last time I saw your mother was here at the museum with you, my mother, yes, and your I daughter, Yes, I've got that wonderful picture of us all. Yes, yeah, indeed. I know. I love that. Eric, you want to see about any questions from anybody here in the room? We have about eight, ten minutes. Thank you so much for a fascinating interview, and it's a joy to watch you embrace your role as a historian. So you mentioned that you were trained as a historian, and I wondered where you did that. Uh, thank you. Um, I went to USC, and I have a master's degree in modern European history, which was, and a, oh, and a, and a minor in French, which was, of course, terribly useful when you came to Santa Paula. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions here in the room? Yes, right over here. Thank you, not, not a question, it's just a compliment. You are a lovely lady, a lovely speaker. Thank you. And I enjoyed your presentation extremely. I'm a former Hearst Castle guide. Ah. And to have lost that beautiful home, that would have been a wonderful house museum. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so true. Thank you for that. Hi, Betsy. Thank you for this. This is this was very, very uh, fun. I got to see your brother again. I haven't seen him in a long time. Um, I live in Santa Paula, and uh, we have talked a little bit beforehand about uh, comparing how you grew up in Santa Paula versus how Santa, what it would be like to, to grow up in Santa Paula today. And I didn't know if you wanted to expand on that a little bit, because I do live there, and I see a lot of differences from what you were talking about in your childhood. Yes, yes. thank you, Mary. Um, in some ways, the remarkable thing about Santa Paula is how little it's changed. You know, I mean, it, it, the population isn't all that much larger um, than, than when I was there. Um, but certainly, um, it, you know, it struggles uh, economically. Uh, it's schools, though not officially segregated by de facto really are. Um, I'm proud to say my daughter and her husband live in Santa Paula and uh, with Eliza Joy, my great granddaughter, now a gosh, seventh generation Santa Paula. She's just your granddaughter. She's oh, not your great granddaughter. Okay, thank you. <laughs> my granddaughter. <laughs> Don't age yourself. Okay. <laughs> and she, she's the only child of an only child. So she's, she's very special. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it, it is, it's a stratified town. Um, uh, very definitely, uh, but I, I think there's there's a core in Santa Paula that's proud of its history, um, and um, and then and yet there's new buds growing. Um, specifically, the Limonera uh, Harvest Project that's 1,500 homes on the east side of Santa Paula, which should um, and the remarkable thing there have been 330 homes built. And 330 homes sold. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's going very strong. And this should help bring some money into Santa Paula's coffers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people are finding that, um, as my grandfather, great grandfather said, this is a beautiful valley, a beautiful valley. And people are discovering that, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we've known. We have a question from one of our Zoom viewers at home. Gail is asking, where did Aunt Sarah get her money to live such a wonderful life in that beautiful house? Thank you, lemons and oranges. Um, the um, grandfather uh, uh, made a great deal of money in citrus. 
um, not only in his own planting in Santa Paula, but also with the Limonera Ranch. And uh, it was a, a, you know, a time um, before income taxes, which I'm sure helped. Uh, but uh, the family um, um, you know, amassed a great deal of money. And so that's how she was, they were able to travel, they were able to collect, and they had, I think, intrinsic good taste. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a very beautiful, um, but uh, an elegant, but not a flashy, flashy home. And you're, I mean, there was a lot of wealth, as you talked about. NWB had some setbacks, but yeah. ultimately, and he was very involved in the community, right? So yes. founded the library, right. founded the high school, and did some, and there were other philanthropic well, as, and community. As, as I say, he was one of the founders of, of Pomona College. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, just on uh, the church, Church of the Foothills. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and also the, the gave the property for the Methodist Church in Santa Paula. So right. he was always very involved. Right. It was a Mason, a lifelong um, Mason and, and a Longfellow. Um, so uh, very involved in the, in the fabric of the community. Mm -hmm. If there aren't any more questions here or online, I have a couple more for Betsy, unless we've got somebody. One more okay. from online. Catherine is curious, Betsy, did you have relationships with the Dowds or McGraths? With the Dowds or McGraths? Yes, the Dowds, I think were Fillmore. Um, and um, uh, Ruthie Dowd uh, was in my mother's um, wedding. She was a, a, a bridesmaid. And uh, now the McGraths is an, are another story. I, of course, am good friends with many of them. But as probably most of you know, they were south of the river. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that. But back before, before 1910, when the first bridges went across the Santa Clara River, to go across that river was a big deal. And uh, you certainly didn't go, want to go during flood time. And so there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, a whole lot of, of back and forth thing. I know my family were good friends of the Bard family. And they would go over to Port Wyneme. And that was, you know, you didn't just go for the day. You know, you would, you would go for a, for a long time. Um, but also, too, it tended, the, um, the south of the river tended to be more Catholic. And, and on this side of the river were more Protestant. So um, there were, uh, you know, all those interesting stratifications. Yeah, the, the flavor, I mean, it's been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. the, the unique, um, distinctive communities of each place. Right. There's definitely a through line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Elena, I'm going to turn it back to you, but but real quick, a gentleman by the name of Ivor Davis at home would like to know, uh, Betsy, when your book becomes a bestseller, can you do an adaptation for Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> Only if Meryl Streep plays me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to thank Ivor. I wish he were here. He's recovering from some surgery, but Ivor was one of my early readers, and you couldn't pay. You can't pay for a better uh, line. Ivor ends his review going, um, it may read like fiction, but it's all true. So <laughs> I've always loved that. And it does. It's a fun read. And Ivor, we're so glad that you're here. I've been thinking about you all night. We are definitely inspired. And Meryl Streep playing you. Yeah. That is fantastic yeah, casting. Thank you. That really is. <laughs> um, I want to end with uh, you talking about your blog because that's another project. Apparently you're not, I mean, I guess you're done with the book and it's being published and printed so you can't rest. Talk to us about your blog and what it's called. Where people um, find it. Well, it's, it's on my website and, and my website is BetsyChessBooks.com. And uh, as a matter of fact, my friend Kathleen is in the back of the of the, the uh, auditorium, ah, oh, there it is. And that's what the book will look like. And uh, if you'd like to pre-order, she can just by chance take your order. <laughs> um, but the blog is on the website. And uh, one thing that I was um, cautioned was if you're gonna write a blog, don't just write one or two because there's nothing worse than returning to a website. And, oh, you know, the last entry was in 19, or 2018 or something like that. So there's only one on right now. And I called it crashing the writer's block. And I've already referred to some of it about how I didn't feel I had anything to add. And so it's, it's about that. But then um, the next one I plan to do is um, something to the effect of finding your voice. And I am so grateful, especially to the strong women in my background. And um, there are so many 
women behind the men in county history. And so I'd like to, in fact, that is probably going to be the next book that I do, um, is about the, the amazing women. We hear all about the men, like the bards. Well, what about their wives? Um, that sort of a thing. So that'll be a part. And then, and then also what I've uh, referred to earlier about um, the kind of uh, the change in, in, in book, in, in publishing. What, where will that take us? Will it be e-books or, or real books? So anyway, tune in. And it's a uh, Betsy Chess Books. Yeah, dot com. Right. So clearly there will be another. Right. Well, my cat, my cat Cubby is working on a book, um, oh, yes. but he, you know, he has some trouble on the computer. So I'm hoping <laughs> children's book. <laughs> well, Betsy, it's just been a joy. Honestly, there's nobody I would rather have gone from virtual into live with than thank you. Thank you. you. And thank you so much. Thank I do you. want to say that our next local history happy hour will be on uh, Tuesday, July 13th. And I will be interviewing Dr. Frank Barajas from Cal State Channel Islands, who's written a book. He's written a number of books, but we're going to be talking about Mexican Americans with Moxie mm -hmm. uh, uh, immigration in Ventura County. So it's about Ventura County specifically. And um, those of you who are here are members. So our members get an opportunity to come and join us in person and actually have the happy hour with us. And we are delighted to have you. So thank you to all of you. And one final toast to Betsy Chess. And a toast to, thank you. A toast, a toast to you, Elena, who has, uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here in this forum without the work of this wit lady and a toast to all of you. Thank you.